Good morning, and welcome to this year's historical Babson moment. This is our first official Juneteenth celebration. And of course, we'll do this celebration very differently than most colleges and universities who are engaged in Juneteenth today. You, we will not only celebrate today with some music and inspiring words, we will also acknowledge that for 400 years, Black people were enslaved in this country under the most heroic, her, her, horrific form of slavery in the world. This moment feels kind of different. It feels like a type of turning point, kind of like 1954 when you know, the country decided it was illegal to uh, have segregated schools and assumed that they were separate but equal. Feels like 1964 when we acknowledged that it was illegal to say that our citizens could not vote in this country, like the March on Washington. It feels, it feels like the, the decisions that were made this week by the Supreme Court overturning past decisions about the rights for the LGBTQ community and for dreamers, this feels different. We're gonna ask you today to be Babs and Brave. You will not only hear, again, the inspirational music appropriate for this time, you'll be educated and provoked to take these moments and actually fuel them for a fierce hope. Fierce hope is not that fluffy stuff that allows us to feel good after you know, a march or after we write that one check. This is, this is hope built on the notion that we are now aware enough to take action in any way we can. And so with that, we're going to begin as we might traditionally begin with any other program acknowledging the Black experience with the singing of the Black National Anthem. Today, this song will be sung by the Pearl Cohen Entertainment Magnet School in Nashville, Tennessee. After this song, the next voice you will hear will be that of Amanda Strong, Babson trustee and chair of the Trustee Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Enjoy this historic Babson moment. <clears throat> to lift, to love, and to give, that is the question. But there is one thing greater to open up your heart and to let it sing. There's no walls, no barrier resistant that can stop the great tide of the everlasting hope. So through it all, keep hope alive. Lift every voice and sing Rejoicing, rising. 
They helped us come together National language to love So music is forever As we march on The victory is won We still have a way to go But yes, we still begun Let's make a joyful noise And let's all sing We came a long way So let freedom ring The whole world sing In perfect harmony Sadie and good afternoon everyone. I think that's such an appropriate way to start the day is with our National Black Anthem on Juneteenth and I'm so honored to be here today. I'm Amanda Strong, class of 1987. I'm also a trustee and the head of the first Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee at Babson College. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to first of all uh, say thank you to the people who put on this event. Um, this is really the first Juneteenth event that we've had, and of course it has to be virtual, but I think it's wonderful. It gives more people the chance to participate, and um, I, I also want to welcome all the students and guests and staff. I have some alumni friends I know who are out there, and uh, I think we have a really great program that you guys have pulled together. I just wanted to read really quickly. I, I, we have a lot of things on the, to cover today, but it, the song that you just heard, Lift Every Voice, uh, sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. And I think it's amazing uh, where we are at today. It's a I won't say it's a happy day for me, it's sad. Um, as we reflect on the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and now Rashad Brooks. Um, but I think where I find hope, and as Sadie said, the, the fierce hope is, uh, you know, just the people who are on the call today and what we're gonna accomplish. I'd like to send a shout out to Steve Spinelli, um, our new Fearless Hope president. And uh, he's been around for about a year and, and, and has really been a wonderful, so we're so happy to have him and, and just an ally and really um, with us fighting the cause. And uh, of course, I also wanna just point out that what we're also at today, 155 years after slavery, the end of slavery, I, I think we need to think about where we're at at Babson. Um, so we have the most diverse board we've ever had in Babson's history. We have uh, a new student center uh, called the uh, Johnson House for our BSU. In addition to that, it's the 50th year for the Black Student Union. Um, 
and we also have three committees now that are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think this is a time to reflect on the past, um, but more importantly, to focus on the future and realize all of the changes that have already been made and the impact that we can truly have. So, so happy to be here today. Uh, we're gonna kick off our festivities right now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amanda, and thank you, Sadie, for that really inspirational welcome as well. And I'd like to extend my own welcome to everyone coming today to Babson's Juneteenth celebration. I'm Gina Reganini from the Alumni and Friends Office. We're so glad to be here with you, and we're so grateful for the strong sense of community that's here, even virtually. For so many reasons, it's important for us to come together and mark this holiday, a change from what Alumni and Friends usually does. For several years, recognizing that Juneteenth is meant to be a joyous holiday surrounded by family gathered around a table, we've sent alumni a recipe card and wishes for time together with their loved ones. This year, we felt that being passive was not what was needed and that our reckon recognition of this day had to be different. When Jane Edmonds, who you'll hear from soon, and Sadie asked what we could do for the Babson community during this difficult time, we came together with multicultural and identity programs and the MLK Legacy Day Committee to find a way to not only celebrate the holiday, but also talk about how we can propel forward. I hope you'll find value and meaning in today's program, which is the result of true partnership within our community bringing together students, staff, faculty, and alumni to acknowledge this day in history and to have a frank conversation about how we will move the Babson family forward. We'll hear from special guest speakers coming up, followed by a short video screening that will uh, guide some small group discussions. Uh, and just as a note, if you've never used the breakout feature on Zoom, uh, rest assured that we've done all the work for you and you'll simply receive a pop-up when it's time for us to break out. So we've done all the work for you, uh, not to worry. After the small group discussions, we'll come back as a larger group to discuss the common themes and discuss some next steps that we can take as individuals and as a Babson community. So let's get on to our program. An alumnus who always answers the call of his alma mater, today we're thrilled to welcome Aaron Walton from the class of 1983 as our keynote. Aaron is the co-founder and CEO of marketing and advertising firm Walton Isaacson and has been honored with awards and recognitions from the American Association of Advertising Agencies, Business Equality Pride Magazine, and Ebony Magazine. He is no stranger to Babson by any stretch, sharing his time and talents frequently, as well as being a recipient of numerous awards, such as the first ever alumni recipient of the MLK Legacy Day Award, the Pride Award, and the Black Affinity Achievement Award. Thank you again to Aaron and all of our speakers coming up for sharing their time and wisdom with us. Aaron, the floor is all yours. Welcome. Thank you, Gina. And uh, thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I can't think of a better way to start off this session than hearing the beautiful voices uh, singing Lift Every Voice, uh, truly inspiring. In mid-March of this year, uh, just days before sheltering in place was the norm, I was a feature speaker at an event in Hollywood. It was more of a uh, conversation format where I was asked questions about the arc of my career, about who and what influenced my journey. And of course, I included a whole section on Babson and how my years here made me who I am today. But the very first question had to do with my childhood influences. And I was specifically asked a question about public speaking and keynote speaking, in fact. And I shared my first memory of seeing and hearing the late, great Barbara Jordan at the Democratic National Convention. And thinking about today's speech, I realized that once again, so much about what Barbara Jordan is all about is relevant to today's celebration and reflections on how far we have come and how much more there's left to do. 
We're here in recognition of Juneteenth, June 19th, 1865, which like Jordan has Texas roots. Not only was Texas where Juneteenth began, but it was the first state to make it a legal holiday. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that June is also Pride Month. And Barbara Jordan reflects the very meaning of intersectionality, a black gay woman whose rights were threatened on all three counts. It was only a few days ago that the Supreme Court said the language of Civil Rights Act in 1964 applies to discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender equality. I'll repeat, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's hard to celebrate this Supreme Court decision with unbridled enthusiasm. It's been a long time coming, but experience has taught us over and over again that there's much more work to do. From court decisions to interacting laws to enabling the manipulation of laws, the road to freedom that equality follows is bumpy and twisted. It curves unexpectedly and details, detours or derails. If you're black, including black trans or gay, you know all of this too well. We all know driving while black is dangerous, literally, but metaphorically speaking, in terms of our travels across 400 years, our journey while filled with joy and achievement is also not for the faint of heart. We know that Juneteenth came two full years after the Emancipation Proclamation. To quote Van Newkirk of The Atlantic, in its spread across the country and gradual supplanting of other emancipation celebrations, Juneteenth has always retained a sense of belatedness. It is the observance of victory delayed, of foot dragging and desperate resistance by white supremacy against the tide of human rights and of legal freedom trampled by the might of state violence. This Juneteenth is both unique and familiar. In 2020, it comes in the midst of two pandemics, but Juneteenth has been a part of our nation's ills before. connect with this holiday's beginnings, we also celebrate all the freedoms, milestones, and moments. We have voices and our actions to a movement, a movement for progress in progress. We remember Dr. King, Bayard Rustin, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, too many heroes to name. And yet, like George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, we must say their names. And of course, our ancestors, those brought here on slave ships, some who were free until they weren't. Some who were never free, even after the law said that they would be. And so we keep doing the work. You know, my sister Valerie Walton, also a Batson alum, reminded me that it wasn't until 1965, when I was four years old, that voting actually became viable for black Americans, even though it was 1870 when the 15th Amendment supposedly barred voting rights discrimination on the basis of race. It did and it didn't. Poll taxes, literacy tests, any number of loopholes blocked black voting every step of the way. So it wasn't until 1965 after Selma that LBJ signed the Voting Act right into law. A year later, a year prior, excuse me, the Civil Rights Act made it possible for Johnson to smash Jim Crow. Some say the Voting Rights Act made the US government accountable to its black citizens for, and for a true democracy to happen for the first time. Others say not so fast. To this day, we know about redlining, voter roll purging. We know that the Electoral College is rooted 
in racial discrimination, we know that there is much more work to do. Remember I told you Texas was the first state to make Juneteenth a legal holiday? What I didn't tell you was that they also reaffirmed their commitment to observing January 19th as Confederate Heroes Day. So much work to do. We can't talk about today without mentioning the devastating loss that are touching all of us around the world. And here at home, and my deep condolences to those of you who have lost a loved one, it would seem that we're only one degree of separation from such a loss. Coincidentally, Barbara Jordan died in 1996 of viral pneumonia. You know, later it was revealed that she also suffered from MS and leukemia. She became the first black woman to be buried in the Texas State Cemetery in Austin. Barbara Jordan is a symbol of the promise of civil rights, not just equality of opportunities, but also equality of outcomes. In 2020, however, we're left wanting, from education to income and job attainment to health disparities, the gap between white Americans and black and brown Americans remains alarmingly similar to what it was in 1964. Make it a point to listen to Barbara Jordan's speech from the 1976 Democratic National Convention, especially when she says, we are a people in a quandary about the present. We are a people in search of our future. We are people in search of national community. We are people trying not only to solve the problems of the present, but we are attempting on a larger scale to fulfill the promise of America. Freedom's promise is far from fulfilled. Juneteenth places progress over perfection and celebrating in the midst of suffering is in and of itself an act of resistance and re <clears throat> excuse me, it's an act of resistance. To quote the writer Imani Perry in her recent article titled, racism is terrible, blackness is not. To identify the achievement and exhilaration in black life is not to mute or minimize racism. It is but to shame racism and damn it to hell. And so we celebrate and we know there is much more work to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Again, it's such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our student keynote speaker, Jalen Bell from the class of 2021 and the current president of the Black Student Union. Jalen, thank you so much for being here. Take it away. Thank you, Jalen, for, for having me. And I, I personally, I, I, I couldn't, when we first opened up, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't hold myself back from shedding, shedding tears of, of joy, of you know, just realizing how historic this moment is. Um, and in that, I want to share with you all that when there is no vision, the people shall perish. And I also want to re remind everyone that today is a very special day, that it reminds us that not only did our ancestors receive freedom on this day, but they economically built this country through hardship and systematic oppression. But what isn't so special is that the average net worth of a Black family household is 18000 and that those same forms of systematic oppression that, that, it, that, it, that it evolved through time. So when we fast forward from June 19th, 1865 to September 3rd, 1919, that same power of entrepreneurship and capitalism, it provides us opportunity and as well as its fair share of deeply rooted challenges. And in such opportunity, I wanna be very transparent with you all. Um, on this call. The wealth gap that we are experiencing, the wealth disparity that we are experiencing and the systematic um, forces that allow for that disparity to happen, that they shall be closed 50 Juneteenth from now. I'll say that again. The wealth gap shall close in 50 Juneteenth from now, 
in DSU's 100th, 100th year anniversary. And before diving into such opportunity, we must address the challenges. And as noted before, these challenges have progressed over time. And as Aaron stated, as, as Aaron Watson stated, that they will improve, improve as we go forward. But it will be more difficult to get to such a vision if you know if diversity and inclusion is not embodied, embodied by all students, faculty, and staff. If those same individuals are not continuously trained and held accountable as it pertains to that core value, which we are currently working on. And if black student athletes and students of color and allies who do not feel supported on campus, uh, it will be more difficult. And even further, it will be even more difficult if society continues to be desensitized to the racial injustice and systemic oppression and the flat out murdering of my brothers, sisters, and ancestors. Because the reality is, we have cried too many tears of pain, everyone on this call. Being removed from campus due to a global pandemic, tears of pain. 400 years of systemic oppression, tears of pain. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and too many and too many others to count, tears of pain. But on this historic moment of our first Juneteenth in such a troubling time of unrest, that experience, that, that, those tears of pain and that experience that we, that we experience now is experienced in our today and in our yesterday 400 years ago. But when we look 50 Juneteenths from now, on June 19th, 2070, our ancestors cry tears of joy and prosperity because they see economic development and systematic reform through the power of entrepreneurship to not only build more businesses in our community, but to provide solutions to, to the systemic issues that we face, as well as through the Johnson House and as well as using the economic and entrepreneurial resources that we have on this call. And through such power and through such resources on a very historic moment that we are experiencing today, such wealth gaps, such wealth, gap, such wealth disparity shall be closed. But in such a large vision, I realized I personally cannot do it alone. Stepping into being the, 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 the president of the Black Student Union in our 50th year anniversary, that stepping in that I was filled with stress and pain and as well as anxiety through the, through, through, through the losses of both of my great grandmas who, 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 who are close, if you have been close to me that you have realized as well that I felt such anxiety to have answers in such a troubling time but realizing that, that I was not alone. So through Healing Spaces led by Patrick Hale and through the Black Affinity Conference led by Leticia Stallworth and through one email by Dean Ward where he said, he advised me to lead with authenticity and as well that I lead on others. And in that, I wanna take this opportunity to truly show appreciation to those who I personally leaned on during this time and to those that we have all leaned on during this time, whether you all realize or not. I first wanna thank God for allowing me to be here and Eric Johnson um, and Babson as well for providing me the Baldwin Bal Richardson Food Scholarship, which changed my life and which changed um, others' lives as, as well as we, as we as will experience through these. Patrick Hill, Leticia Starworth, Black Affinity Network, you are appreciated. Tina Opie, Dr. Sadie Burton Gross, Jane Edmonds, you are appreciated. Chatine Gat Chatik Gatlin, um, Denicia Radley, Sydney Swain, Wes, my brother, if you are on this call, you are appreciated. CNZ Udalani, um, DSU Ebor, the Black Student Athletes, you are appreciated. And to all allies who stepped up during this time, realizing the pain of our community during such a time of, 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 of troubling and of unrest, you are appreciated as well, Brittany Aguayo. Um, Isabelli Santos, president of One, um, Andrea Linder, president of SGA, and to the, all of the 70 student organizations who stepped up on campus to organize a campus-wide fundraiser for Black Lives Matter. You are also appreciated, Elizabeth Swanson, um, Kevin Brunel, Gina Denny, and the list goes on and on and on. Because in such large vision of closing such a wealth gap that has been created through systematic oppression, the only way that we can all truly get there is through unity and through leaning on one another, as Dean Ward advised. 
So if you want to learn more, please email us at bsu at babson.edu as I personally really didn't introduce or talk about myself because I realized at this time it's not about me and that it's bigger than me, that it's about all of us coming together to create that change for us and for our ancestors as 50 June, from, it's, it's important for us to come together um, to make that change 50 Juneteenth from now in unity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jalen. Um, just from a, a personal note, I'm always so glad to work with you and I'm so proud to know you. Um, and I know I can speak for those that you named uh, that they would say the same as well. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to give the floor to Jane Edmonds, Vice President for Programming and Community Outreach. Thank you, Gina. Powerful words, it's a powerful moment. As Jalen just said, I appreciate everyone that's on this panel. It's a beautiful day. On this day of celebration, Black Lives Matter, as they have for 400 years and since the beginning of time. And still, if we're gonna really celebrate the end of enslavement, it requires us all to continue to struggle for civil and human rights and to commit, I mean, really seriously commit to active allyship. Each and every one of us can take a step toward justice. And at the end of the day, it is our very actions that reveal what's in our hearts and minds. It's our actions. It's not our rhetoric. It's our actions. So I'd like to share a short video with you. It's less than two minutes. And admittedly, it may trigger some painful emotions for some of you. So if you would like, you can disconnect the audio and video for a couple of minutes. And I hope while the video plays, and then rejoin us for what I hope will be a fruitful and uplifting discussion. Mara, let's roll. Please stop. Sir, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. I'm taking pictures and calling the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I'm in the Ramble, and there is a man, African-American, who has a bicycle helmet. He is recording me and threatening me and my dog. There is an African-American man, I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. And my... I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the Ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the Ramble. I don't know. Thank you. Now, using, using the chat function, just record your first reaction to what you saw. What comes to mind? What did you see? Let's just take a few minutes just to record your impressions in the chat box. So I think we can see, without even letting the chat expression um, continue, you're free to continue to input that. But what do we see? I saw words like horrified, disgusted. I saw insanity, 
racism. Ignorance, that's a big one. And matter of fact, if I could just pause a bit and imagine that I knew Amy Cooper. Somehow, using my networks, I was able to connect with her. And just for a moment, imagine that I'm having a conversation with Amy Cooper about what we just saw, what we witnessed. So it might go something like this. Um, Amy, may we talk? Do you even realize what you just did? Now, if you're open to it, I would love to help. But I'm not really sure that you understand the indignity you visited upon Christian Cooper. And think about the last name, Cooper, the same as yours. That could have been your brother. You know, what would, would this event even have occurred if he was packaged in the same skin as yours? Perhaps not. Do you realize the stress that he experienced from your verbal assault? Do you have a clue? From your insistence that he not be where he was while being who he was, and that he not talk back to you? Come on, Amy. I'm not even sure that you understand that he was the protector of the law, and you were the lawbreaker with disastrous consequences just in the horizon of your encounter. You know, Amy, Christian Cooper could have wound up just like George Floyd. Hashtag say his name. Do you even understand what you evoked when you pulled your ace and waved it like a red cape at the NYPD? Do you understand that only by some miracle, by some grace, that he emerged from his encounter with you with his body intact? Do you worry about what you did to his mind, to his heart, to his very soul? Amy, do you even know who Emmett Till was? Do you know about the 3,446 African-American people who are known to have been lynched? Lynched. I mean, terrorized, tortured, hung, burned, dismembered, and more in this country, in this free country. Most often black men for the crime of looking to at or speaking to or threatening a white woman. And do you know that that number is the tip of an iceberg of repressed histories of violence against black people? Body, mind, soul, and heart, lives taken and never recorded, marked and mourned, except by the families who loved and lost them in the worst ways imaginable? Do you know? Now, enough of my emotions, because believe it or not, Amy, I'm so encouraged by you because you apologized right away. And you know, while your apology honestly to me doesn't erase what happened, it gives me such hope. You give me hope that you're open to thinking differently than maybe you did before and to learning. And in fact, the world is giving me hope that in the words of Sam Cooke, a change is gonna come. Mara, let's watch.
Hope, incredible hope in Paris, in Denver, Colorado, in London, in Australia, all over the world, I see hope for the change that we all want for our greater society. And without hope, with hope comes an opportunity to change. And in order to change, we need to better know our history. Knowing our history gives us that opportunity to make those behavioral changes that will fulfill hope. So I'm now turning the program to my dear colleague, Professor Elizabeth Swanson. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for having me um, as a speaker on this historic day, historic for Babson, historic for the country, historic for the world. Um, I wanna thank all, this, all the people who made this possible, especially Sadie Burton-Goss, Jane Edmonds, um, Amanda Strong, who stands strong always with us. I wanna thank Letitia Stallworth for holding up the sky with the Black Affinity Network, um, and Jalen for his incredible leadership of the BSU and his leadership as a, as a diversity leader scholar on our campus whom I've had the privilege of watching grow into the order that you heard a moment ago. 
Um, I've been invited to talk a little bit about historical literacy, which is my passion. And I believe that if we had greater historical literacy in this country, that we would perhaps be able to move towards that hope and that change that Jane talks about. But without being willing to look at our wounds, I don't have as much hope um, that we'll be able to move through this moment. And it is a moment. There has been an opening. And to my mind, and I believe probably everyone on this call, the moment has been opened again, the same veil being torn again. But this time, on the heels of watching and witnessing footage of Ahmad Arbery being hunted, literally, and then killed, Breonna Taylor in her home, and then George Floyd, the eight minutes and 46 seconds that George Floyd endured, that his family and beloveds must endure, and that the world must endure, and that that perpetrator somehow must also endure. What's open now in that what we've seen is a moment that we could fill, um, and the scenes that we just witnessed of people in the streets is filling them, and people not going home in spite of tear gas, in spite of, in spite of rubber bullets, in spite of the usual crackdown on the very thing that our country is built on, which is the freedom to express ourselves together. Um, still, people are not going home. But let us not let this be a moment um, that ends with those protests and doesn't, the energy doesn't continue to make the change because the change is quite obvious. It is a system that was built for 400 years and it is a system that can be undone and the time is now and the people to do that work mostly are white people at this point. Um, I'd like to just start though by centering a voice, Amiri Baraka, the uh, poet voice of the Black Power Movement in this country. And this is a poem that he delivered in 1995 as part of a, con a collection that was meant to um, explore the American dream. I'd like to pull that up um, and introduce, first of all, Baraka as someone who expressed the Black Power side of the civil rights moment, the side that um, was claiming pride, um, beauty in Blackness, and asserting it. Um, in different ways than just the peaceful marches. So, um, Maura, if you could bring us Amiri Baraka. burn in. That X is black and leaves an empty space. It is that place where we live, the Afro-American nation. If the flag catch a fire and an X burn in, the only stripes is on our back, the only star blown free in the northern sky, no red, but our blood. white but slavers and clucks in the woods no blue but our song if the flag catch a fire and an x burn in that x is black and that space that is left is our history now a mystery we only live where the flag is not where the air is funky the music hot inside the hole in the american soul that space that place empty of democracy we live inside the burned boundaries of a wasted symbol x humans x slaves unknown incorrect crossed out multiplying the wealth of others if the flag catch a fire and an expert in the x leave it it's black So much more. So, um, yeah, Kerry Rourke, literature is powerful. Amiri Baraka, he set out the X, um, as many people were doing in the 60s, many Black people, Malcolm X most prominently, as a space of the unknown, the unknown history, all that had been taken, all that had been lost. X will mark my name because I don't have a name aside from the name of the slaveholder. So, what can we do with that X? 
that Amiri Baraka says is the empty space at the heart of democracy, the empty space at the heart of the American soul. How could we fill it? Um, what will we fill it with? If a flag, if the flag catch fire and an ex burn in, if, when, it will only keep being when the flag catches fire, right? We've been, we've been arguing over this flag. Well, who is it going to represent? So I'm going to use the rest of my time to talk about how we might use this moment that was opened in that eight minutes and 46 seconds of unfathomable atrocity that we might make change finally and make that X be something other than the emptiness where democracy was. So I'm going to say, here's what I think we, one thing, one tool, historical literacy, start to read, learn, train figure out what is the truth at the heart of this country, to know that the social contract that was built by our founding fathers was always a lie. And we have just accepted it. It was a lie because it was not a social contract that included everyone. It included white men. It excluded women and it most certainly excluded every other black and brown and most importantly in this, in this country in many ways, indigenous people with our similar colonies. So I think one thing to start, our history is not a straight line progress narrative from slavery to freedom. That is, that is not the case. But we have that narrative, we, we sort of say it loud and proud is a dominant thing that people are taught, right? So what a lot of people don't understand is that under that, there's a circular history. It's what Amiri Baraka called the changing same. It might be a different time, a different place, a different moment in a different body, but it will be that same violence um, that we have witnessed with George Floyd. How can we make the, that repetitive traumatic history stop? I wanna read you a line from Toni Morrison, whose character, in Beloved, the novel about an escaped um, family of enslaved people, um, where one of the, a person who had formerly been enslaved, his name is Paul D. he's a major protagonist, and he runs into Satha, the other protagonist who he knew back when they were enslaved, and they meet each other, and they're trying to figure out what to say, how much to reveal of all that they've been through that's traumatic, and Paul D. says, or the narrator says in Paul D's mind, saying more might push them both to a place they couldn't get back from. He would keep the rest where it belonged, in that tobacco tin buried in his chest where a red heart used to be, its lid rusted shut. That's a description of trauma. That's traumatic memory. That's the kind of memory that you can't let out because it is too painful and too difficult. And Paul D, that image of the tobacco tin in his heart, I think is a really fine image for the tobacco tin heart of, of America. It is harming all of us. It is harming black people, most obviously, and brown people, and indigenous people, and trans and LGBTQ people, and you immigrants, refugees, let's go on. Um, but it's also hurting white people. It is turning white people into a structural perpetrator identity. Well, it's not turning them, it's been that way. And we don't have any language to talk about how white individuals can be very fine upstanding individuals and also occupy a skin that has a perpetrator history to it. How do we start to undo that? Um, I wanna say to you quickly, cause time is short, that I believe the reconstruction area, era is a, is a moment to focus on and to realize that when Juneteenth happened even in the language of Juneteenth. I want to tell you the language of the actual proclamation after saying yep, you're free says the freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military stations, in other words get any kind of other living from perhaps having helped in the Civil War, and that they will not be supported by idleness either there or elsewhere idleness right there on the, the end of enslavement right there you're not going to be idle after you know after this long history of enslavement and that kind of language those stereotypes those tropes about black people that were embedded in slavery that had to do with idleness laziness shiftlessness etc um, made their way right into our lexicon and have continued to the present in the reconstruction era what we learned from books like slavery by another name by Doug Blackman, um, Chained in Silence by Talithia LaFloria, um, Slaves of the State by Dennis Child, is that all throughout this long reconstruction period from 1877 to, to 2020, um, there has been, there was a replacement for slavery, bam, right away, it was called convict leasing. 
And it was that sense of if you are idle um, or we need workers and we can't have you the way we had you before, we'll just give you, we'll just trump up some charges. They're called the, the black codes, the pig laws, the codes for that governed the behavior of black people in, in relation to white people um, for if, up until the Civil Rights Act. If you learn about that moment, then you'll see this is just the changing same. The linearity is actually in the violation and it is time for white people to make that stop. Um, so I will end by saying that the clip that Jane showed us and, and the very powerful conversation that she had with Amy Cooper, those stereotypes and what could have happened to Christian Cooper in that moment are the same that have been used from the beginning of this country. They are dehumanization. You turn a whole population into something less than human. You say you are three fifths of a person. You say you are not um, able to care for yourselves as human. Um, that's the first thing, dehumanization. Then alienation. You are not a citizen of this place, right? And we're still fighting out birthright citizenship that should have been guaranteed in the 14th Amendment. You may have heard our president threaten it when we started um, having a lot of refugees at our southern border. Um, you see enforced submission. Christian Cooper, stop filming me. Christian Cooper refused. That white woman got on that call and did the thing that she knew to do, which was to call in the cavalry um, because this black man was not staying in the place that she understood he should be in. And finally, criminalization. The criminalization of black people, which leads to their deaths in the streets on arms, which leads to mass incarceration, which leads to um, the disaster that we're in. So I want to leave you with thinking about the X, the X. Let it not be a burning X. Let it be an X that fills with justice, equality, the actual social contract that we dreamed up and we just never, ever manifested. Um, and I thank you for giving me this room today um, to speak. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and now we'll uh, move on to uh, Megan Way, Associate Professor and Chair of the Economics Division, and Patrick Hale, Director of Multicultural and Identity Programs. Good afternoon, everyone, um, or afternoon in Massachusetts, uh, morning from other parts of the country. Um, thank you to um, Professor Swanson for that in really important um, foundational laying out in terms of thinking about the historical impacts of institutionalized um, racism and the ways in which that is, continues to manifest today. Um, and so um, I am speaking on behalf of um, me, um, Professor Megan Way um, to um, welcome you to this next portion of our time where we're gonna be engaging in some small group discussion to process what you've seen, what you've learned today, and also to think about how we can continue to move forward as a community. Um, in the spirit of making sure that we have respectful dialogue, I would like to propose a few um, guidelines for discussion or ground rules to help us move this conversation along. And so um, I'll ask Mara to bring those up for us to review. Um, but the first that I would like to propose to the group is to be present. Um, your full engagement will enhance our learning. Um, and so we ask that you be very actively engaged by listening to folks, by contributing as much as possible. We also ask that you pra practice confidentiality. And by that, what I mean is whatever is shared in your breakout space stays within that space, but the learning that you that you gain from that space, you can take with you and share that out as well. And so just be really respectful as you're hearing a story, make sure that you're not revealing the identity of the person who shared that story. Share the airtime. We ask that you balance your participation and make space for all voices. Um, if you're someone who tends to speak a lot, that you try to be mindful of making sure that other folks have the chance to share as well. Be open to new perspectives. Um, this is an opportunity for you to learn something new and maybe expand your worldview. Um, and so we ask that you really lean into that. Reserve the right to change your mind. Um, if you came into this space with thinking one way, and you leave with thinking a different way, that is perfectly okay. It's, it is okay if your opinions or thoughts change. We ask that you also take care of yourself. You're allowed to take responsibility for your needs. This is a very emotionally charged conversation and we wanna make sure that you're doing everything in your power to take care of yourself and you have full permission to do that. Embrace vulnerability. Allow yourself to be fully seen as you are able. We are, we are all coming into these conversations as we are and it's important for us to be, be fully willing to be our full selves in this space. And so we, we wanna give you permission to do that as well. 
And finally, refrain from passing judgment. This is an opportunity for us to learn together, to grow together, and to be together as one to really do the, the work to move forward. And so we ask that you do that in a way that is respectful of people and how they share and engage. Uh, because we're all in different points in this journey. And as long as we're working together, we'll all be doing the best that we can. So with that, um, I, we have over 20, we have 23 facilitators on this call and we're really excited that they have all agreed to lead these conversations. And our hosts are gonna be bring, breaking us into groups. Um, we'll be exploring two different questions throughout these discussions. Um, and we encourage you all to engage with each other and we look forward to having some really great dialogues with all of you. Thanks, Patrick. So with that, um, Liz, please go ahead. Hello. 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 All right. So welcome back, everyone. Um, I believe at this point the um, the small group breakout sessions have ended. Um, and so I want to thank everyone for taking the time to um, engage in conversations with one another. Um, I, re I recognize that the, t uh, the conversation time was short. Um, and we certainly know that these conversations can't happen in 20, 30 minutes, but I encourage you all to continue these conversations within your own respective circles and spheres. Um, this is a comma, not a period, and these conversations should be mm -hmm. ongoing um, in an effort to make sure that we're moving forward. And so with that, um, I wanna say thank you all uh, on behalf of Megan Way and myself for engaging, and thank you to our facilitators for being willing to lead these conversations. And with that, I would like to turn it over to the wonderful Dr. Tina Opie. Thank you so much, Patrick. Hello, everyone. My apologies for my surroundings, but for Juneteenth, my family decided to head to the beach to Cape Cod. So we are actually here with some friends and family, socially distancing, um, but also wanting to get together in a smaller environment where we could really love on each other and, and reflect on some of our life experiences. So. Some of the themes, what I've been asked to do is just share general themes that I had in my group and also maybe some insights that I had. So the first thing that I want to talk about is that it was very interesting that there seems to be in general dual experiences of the video with Christian Cooper and the perpetrator, Amy Cooper. On one hand, there's shock and surprise. So people are actually 
astounded that this white woman would engage in such behavior and that she would call and that she would cause her voice to raise to to give the perception that there was imminent threat and what's interesting is sometimes in court cases the 911 calls are actually used as evidence against the accused so to me that was really interesting to consider that some people are shocked and surprised by that they think she actually may be mentally ill or something related to that in contrast there are people who are in fact familiar with amy cooper they have in fact been in a situation that would have placed them in in christian cooper's shoes i for example have experienced that at babson college i've shared that with many of you um, and <clears throat> The familiarity is unfortunate, and it's something that can start at a very, very young age. So here again, we see this tale of two Americas, of two different experiences, and I want us to then bring back to Boston College. So in our group, we did begin to think about some of the, the different experiences that students, staff, staff might have so related to that, I encourage people who were shocked and surprised to maybe do a little bit of digging before you actually go to individuals and ask them, if you do research on microaggressions and things of that nature, you will find that there are, these experiences are commonplace. And I, I wouldn't necessarily call what Amy Cooper did a microaggression. I mean, to me, was, as uh, Elizabeth Swanson said, she called in the cavalry. And as a white woman, she very well knew what might happen to Christian Cooper as a result of that. So the first point is dual experiences. And my action is to actually try to gain more knowledge. Should I continue speaking or do you all want to go to something else? We lost you oh. for a moment there. Dr. Opie, we, we lost you for a moment okay. there. So, yes, if you could close. Okay, yeah. my apologies. Okay, so thank you. So the, the, I'll close with this, which is, this is a more powerful statement, but I, I, people may be astonished, but one of the challenges is throughout history, uh, white women in particular, have had two critical tools to access and keep them in the digital world in tears. So I want us to look at the history of that. If you don't believe me, please that research because the, the use tears is in fact uh, an ability to get access. Sadie, it looks like Tina actually dropped off the call. Would you okay. mind closing us up? I'm happy to close. Thank you. Dr. Opie, thank you so much for your insights. I want to thank everyone who has played such a powerful and active role in today's historical moment at Babson College, our first Juneteenth celebration. I opened the program by saying that we would do this very differently from other colleges and universities. We'd have the inspirational words, we'd have the song, but that we would also go deeper and actually create some feelings of disruption about how many may be viewing their realities at this time. I want to suggest to you that as we are challenged about how do we bring this home to Babson, I want to keep it simple. Every day you witness and observe something taking place at Babson that you know is not inclusive, is in fact racist, is in fact an action or a decision that diminishes or, or dehumanizes another human being. Part of that whole history of 400 plus years was literally convincing the world that we were not human. 
and the, and the reason something like these experiences that we have talked about today can happen is because we can assume that the individuals having these experiences are not as human as others might be. We can actually allow that to take place. Today and days going forward, I give, I give you two challenges, maybe three. One, when you gaze upon a black student at Babson, no mistaken identity. If this individual was able to make it to Babson, they are more amazing than almost anybody teaching or working here at this time. I want you to put that thought in your head. When you gaze upon a black student at Babson, just assume they have to be more than amazing for what they've already lived through, what they've already experienced, and then what they will experience daily and not talk that much about. The Amy Cooper uh, moment in the park is a daily experience for many people at Babson. It, I'm calling it mistaken identity. I am you, you are me. Our students are our students. They are our children, they are your children. Someone, some parents have loaned them to us for this time to not only educate, but to care for. And so I want you to put that in your mind first and foremost. The decisions that leaders make every day are made through the lenses of their experience. If you have not ever witnessed or experienced a black person as, as someone other than someone working for you, cleaning your house or caring for your children, it could be difficult to acknowledge that we are peers, that we are equals in every right. And indeed, that my experiences may have given me a type of strength and pre perseverance that you'll never have to develop. I want you to elevate that type of thinking from this day forward. Whatever your first thought is about your encounters, just like you saw with Amy Cooper they, will, Cooper, they will dictate your action going forward. You have had a powerful day of experience, education, exposure, and dialogue. Many of you are waiting for somebody else to now pull you to a next level, educate and teach you about everything else you need to know. You are either educators or educated people that can seek out the information you need to inform more action. From this day forward, do it. Don't be looking to the left or to the right, to the president, to me, to start your action. You have enough to begin with. We are here for you, but don't let that stop you from making this day the day that everything changed and how you will go forward. I appreciate those of you who have marched and I've had my days of marching. Now I'm marching to the neighbors uh, next door to figure out if they are uh, okay. I'm marching to the telephone to check on my family, my, my children. I'm marching to my checkbook to write checks to the NAACP, my church, food pantries. I'm, I'm marching to people that I don't even know to find out if they're okay. Take your march to a personal level. And from this day forward, Commit to a type of action that is radical and that in fact instills a radical hope that tomorrow will in fact be different. And as our, our student speaker Jalen Bell said, I like it to be in less than 50 years, but in 50 years when we are celebrating the 100th celebration of the Black Student Union, all disparities have disappeared, all wealth disparities have, all gaps have been closed, uh, and the world that we are actually living in and leading in is quite different. We are Babson College. We have everything we need to do this differently and better. I've enjoyed my time with President Spinelli. I don't agree with everything that he might say or do, but I am, I am inspired and clear that right now we have the leadership we need to do this differently. On behalf of um, President Spinelli, the Board of Trustees, Amanda Strong, um, all college leaders, all students, and you. I say thank you, and I look forward to the, uh, to the revolution of what Babson will lead in the coming days and for the future. Thank you.